Welcome back, fellow humans. I'm Jason. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that's truly explosive, or actually, maybe not quite as explosive as you might think. If the protons in the nucleus of all atoms are positive, and positive charges push and repel each other, then why doesn't the nucleus of all atoms just blow apart like a firecracker? Well, strap in, because today we're diving into the atomic world to find out why your body and everything else you've ever touched doesn't just explode into a cloud of particles. You know, when you learn chemistry or even basic physics, even, even in middle school level, sixth or seventh grade level, we're taught that the nucleus contains these positive charges, right? And they're pushing on each other because all positive charges repel. And of course, there are neutrons in the nucleus as well. So everything should be pushing apart from each other from inside the nucleus. So why doesn't everything on the inside just fly apart? Why do we have stable nuclei in the first place? So first, let's take a second to recap the basics, right? In the nucleus of every atom, in every atom in every corner of the universe, there are positively charged protons, and then there are also neutrons, which have mass but no net charge. So almost all of the mass of the entire atom is concentrated in the nucleus. Now, surrounding the nucleus is a cloud of these negative things we call electrons, which have negative charge. So protons, we talk about having a positive charge, and according to electrostatic attraction and repulsion, like charges repel each other. That means, theoretically, the protons in the nucleus should be pushing on each other with quite a bit of force because the protons are really close together. So why doesn't the nucleus just fly apart and explode? In other words, why do we have any stable atoms at all? So it turns out that our universe has a very clever trick up its sleeve, and it's called the strong nuclear force. So this is one of the four fundamental forces in nature, and it's sort of the superhero that saves the day here with the nucleus. So the strong nuclear force is incredibly powerful, that's why it's called strong, much, much, much stronger than the electromagnetic force that causes the protons to repel each other in the first place, but the strong nuclear force only acts over incredibly short distances. We should all take a second to let this actually sink in. Every force in the universe that you've ever had any contact with, friction, pushing, pulling, anything, is one of four fundamental forces. There's gravity, there's the strong nuclear force that we're talking about today, there's the weak nuclear force, which relates to radioactivity in the nucleus of atoms, and then there's the electromagnetic force, which governs attraction and repulsion of charged particles. Now, of these, gravity is by far actually the weakest of all of these forces. We think of gravity being very, very strong, but actually it's the weakest of all of the forces. If you think about it, when you're standing on the planet, the entire planet is pulling on you. All the atoms, you know, even buildings in Tokyo and Sydney and other places are pulling on you. But I can just jump with my feet and I can temporarily overcome gravity with my feeble little muscles in the body. So gravity is the weakest force in nature. And not only is it the weakest, but it's the weakest by a great amount. The electric attraction and repulsion of like protons and electrons is actually millions of times stronger than gravity, millions. And it acts over very long distances, right? Theoretically across the universe. But the strong nuclear force acts between protons and neutrons and other subatomic particles, and that one is even millions of times stronger than the electromagnetic force, right? Very, very strong force. However, that strong force that exists only inside the nucleus is only able to act over incredibly short distances. It doesn't go beyond the nucleus at all, whereas electromagnetism and gravity extend over much, much longer distances. So I'd like you to sort of think about the strong nuclear force as kind of like the cosmic equivalent of superglue that when protons and neutrons get close enough, and they do have to be close, within about one femtometer, which is a millionth of a billionth of a meter, right, the, the diameter of a proton or something like this scale here, then the strong nuclear force kicks in and it binds them very, very tightly, millions of times stronger than the other forces. And this force is actually strong enough to overcome the repulsion of the protons that are trying to blow the nucleus apart all the time. Now, neutrons in the nucleus don't have any charge, but they actually play a crucial role in all of this too. They don't have any charge, but 
they have mass, and they help to mediate the strong nuclear force and add additional binding energy and force pulling and holding the nucleus together. So the presence of neutrons effectively acts as a buffer between the positively charged protons, sort of spreading them out so they're not too close together, and so mediating or mitigating the electromagnetic repulsion. You can sort of think of like baking a cake or baking a pie, and if you put raisins inside of it, those could be like the protons, and then maybe you put some cherries or something inside of it, and those are like the neutrons. Well, if you don't have any cherries, and then all of the raisins, the protons, are all really close together, and they have a lot of force to make the nucleus unstable and blow it apart. But the addition of the neutrons spreads things out in the nucleus, spreads the protons out, and uh, provides additional strong force to kind of hold everything together. And there's actually a very delicate balance to maintain to all of this with regard to protons and neutrons in the nucleus. If you have too few or too many neutrons, then the nucleus can become unstable, and this is what leads to radioactive decay. So this is why certain isotopes of elements are radioactive and others aren't. It's because they have an imbalance in the number of neutrons in the nucleus, which disrupts the stability provided by the strong nuclear force. I always wondered this when you know, I was in high school chemistry, but this is kind of the secret to all of this stuff. When you look in the periodic table, you're gonna notice as you go into the higher and higher elements, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and you keep going down into heavier elements, that we have more protons with each element, of course, but you also have more neutrons. And it's never really explained early on when you're learning this stuff why the neutrons are there. And this is why they're there because the protons are pushing on each other and physically trying to explode the nucleus all the time. Now, the protons uh, exert a strong nuclear force trying to hold it together, but when you have too many protons there, it, it, it doesn't extend far enough to physically hold the nucleus together to overcome the, uh, the repulsion there. But by the addition of some neutrons, which, by the way, they don't have any charge, but they also exert a strong nuclear force in the nucleus. It's like these neutral particles that help hold it together with the strong nuclear force. So not only are neutrons neat to learn about, they're absolutely essential, because if you don't have any neutrons in a heavy element, then the nucleus is completely unstable, and that's what we talk about when we talk about radioactive elements. Those are elements that are decaying all the time, shooting out protons and other particles because the nucleus isn't stable. So in the beginning when I said, why doesn't the nucleus just explode, that's kind of a, that's kind of a simple kind of like idea in our head. What would really happen is it would just be unstable and it would start decaying particles and transmute into lighter and lighter elements because it's unstable. So as an example, if you pick a random uh, element like iron or something, it has a, a, a given number of neutrons in the most common form of iron, right? Now there can be a little bit more or a little bit less number of neutrons and we call those isotopes of iron or isotopes of carbon. You might hear carbon 12, carbon 13, things like that, right? But if you have the element with like no neutrons at all or too few neutrons, then what's going on is the neutrons provide some of the strong nuclear force that holds the nucleus together. So if you don't have any or if you don't have enough of them, then the nucleus is unstable with too few neutrons because there's not enough strong nuclear force there. And if you go to the other extreme and you put too many neutrons in, then what happens there is the nucleus just gets so large with too, too many neutrons that even though those neutrons are giving strong nuclear force, don't forget that force is only over a very short distance. So if you make the nucleus too physically large, then the strong force doesn't help you anymore because it's too big for that strong force that acts over small distances to actually do anything. So the nucleus is again unstable. So for every element, you have a range of neutrons. You can have a little bit less than the optimal number of neutrons and a little bit more than the optimal amount of neutrons and it's still stable. But if you have like too few, then the nucleus is radioactive and unstable. And if you have too many neutrons, again, the nucleus is radioactive and unstable. Now remember from your elementary chemistry or physics, the element itself is governed by the number of, nu of, of protons in the nucleus. So uh, a, a, an element of a given number of protons just determines if it's carbon or if it's hydrogen or if it's oxygen or whatever it is. But the different number of neutrons that can exist in the nucleus, it still retains the character of the element. It just becomes heavier or lighter if it has too many or too few neutrons. And we call these isotopes. So when you hear about carbon isotopes, like carbon-12 and carbon-13 and carbon-14 in nature, every element on the periodic table has isotopes with a little bit less neutrons and a little bit more neutrons, they still chemically behave as the element, but they just might be a little bit heavier uh, or a little bit lighter. 
Now, carbon-12, as an example, is the most stable isotope on Earth with a 98.5 or something like that percent uh, percent abundance in the Earth's, Earth's crust. So if you look hard enough, you can find slightly heavier carbon with a little bit more neutrons and, 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 and perhaps even a lighter version of carbon, if that isotope exists at all. But again, there's a range. You can have a little bit too few, a little bit too much. Everything is still somewhat stable, but there's a range. And outside that range, the, the element won't exist because you have to have a range of neutrons in there to help provide the strong force to hold the nucleus together. So let's take a second to give you an idea of just how strong the strong nuclear force is. I want you to consider this. It's what holds together protons and neutrons in the nucleus of heavy elements, for instance, uranium, which has 92 protons. The repulsive force, the electromagnetic force pushing between these protons is enormous, but the strong nuclear force overpowers it and keeps the nucleus intact. And now that we've introduced sort of our hero of the story, what allows atoms to exist, the strong force, let's dive a little bit deeper into the origin of the strong force and how it arises from the tiny building blocks of matter, which we now call quarks. Now for a long, long, long time, once we were able to break apart the, the nucleus of an atom, we thought that protons and neutrons were fundamental building blocks, but it turns out that at the heart of protons and neutrons are something smaller, and those are called quarks. So those are incredibly small particles that come in six sort of flavors, which we call up, down, charm quark, strange quark, top quark, and bottom quark. And before we get into this too far, I remember being really confused about this. Why is it called up and down and top and bottom? What's going on with these quarks is they have what we call quantum numbers associated with them. We have quantum numbers associated with electrons and other subatomic particles as well. It's not something you deal with in the real world, but when you get on the atomic scale, the particle is really governed by what we call these quantum numbers. For an electron, you have like the spin angular momentum and other quantum numbers associated with the electrons uh, surrounding an atom. So for these quarks, what we have is different quantum numbers that are in the standard model of particle physics, and the values of those different numbers govern sort of configurations of quarks. So when you have quantum numbers that are, that are nailed down in a certain way, we just call it the up quark. And when you have quantum numbers that are uh, different values, that are always the same set of values, we call it the down quark and so on. And it turns out that in the current theory, there are six flavors of stable quarks, and you have to give them some sort of name. So you call them up and down and charm and strange and top and bottom. But those names don't have anything to do with anything. They're just labels. You could call it the vizra quark or the va vizra vizra quark. I mean, it's just a name. Don't think about the flavor of up and down or charm and strange meaning too much in specific. So those are the quarks. Now, for protons and neutrons, which we're mainly interested in here, we're mainly interested in the up and the down quark. Electrons are different, actually, and they're more fundamental, and according to the current theory, electrons are not composed or comprised of, of anything smaller, no, certainly no quark in, in the electron. But the protons and the neutrons that have almost all of the mass of the atom, they're composed of three quarks each. So according to the standard model, a proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark, right? While a neutron consists of two down quarks and one up quark, right? Now these quarks are held together by the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what is inside of a proton holding it all together, holding the quarks together by a particle called a gluon. Yes, a gluon, because they sort of glue the quarks together. How charming, right? Everybody's so creative in particle physics. You know, and I don't want to get too philosophical here, but people ask me all the time, how do we know any of this is true? How do we know there's an up and a quark and a down quark and a charm quark? And how do we know that one of them is like two up and one down? And do they just make it up or what? No, what happens is you have observations. And the observations usually come from particle accelerators when you smash things together and see what comes out, right? And you have a, a theory, a framework, and say, well, if you had these things called quarks, and if they were held together by something called gluons, which is the carrier of uh, the strong nuclear force, in quantum mechanics, in modern, you know, standard model of particle physics, the forces are all carried by tiny little particles. They literally, the forces are carried by particles, in this case called a gluon, 
uh, down at that level. And if all of that is true, then we should have these stable configurations and we should see X, Y, and Z when we smash things together. And then you go build something and you go smash X, Y, and Z and you see what you get. And if it matches with your theory, then you think your theory is pretty accurate. Now, do we think the standard model of particle of physics here is 100% correct? No, because there's, there's always some inconsistencies. However, it is very, very accurate for calculating things in collisions, for predicting how things are going to bind together, the binding energy, how much force it takes to pull something apart is very, very accurate. And we can do experiments to see if the theory is on the right track. So it's not that people are guessing and just rolling the dice. They propose something and then they test something and see how close those two things are. So the strong force is unique in the world of fundamental forces. So unlike gravity or electromagnetism, which gets weaker with distance, the strong force actually gets stronger as the quarks move farther apart. So you can kind of think of it sort of as a bungee cord or a rubber band. You pull on it and then it wants to snap back with increasing force the farther you pull it away. So take a minute and zoom yourself into the nucleus of an atom, but even smaller than that, inside of a proton. We say there are three quarks in every proton and there are three quarks inside of every neutron. And these quarks are held together by this strong force, which is mediated by something called a gluon there. But that force behaves different than other forces of nature that are on larger scales. Specifically, as the quarks try to get farther apart from each other, the strong force actually gets stronger instead of weaker. I mean, think about gravity. When two things are very far apart, the force between them gets weaker, right? Like the force between the moon and the earth, if you take the moon and you move it out to Pluto, then the force between them is much, much, much smaller. That's how normal forces work for us, right? Same thing with electric attraction. If they're very close together, they're attracted very strongly. If they're very far apart, they're attracted a lot less so. Same thing with magnets. But the quarks are mediated by the strong force and the strong force is different. So it's different in that as the quarks are bouncing around in there and they try to get farther apart, the strong force actually gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So the quarks can never separate from each other because as they get farther and farther apart, the force between them, the strong force gets stronger and that holds it together. And that's why uh, the, the strong nuclear force is so strong because as it gets farther and farther apart, the strong force gets uh, stronger to hold everything together. And that is why protons and neutrons in nature are very, very stable particles. Protons don't really decay. A neutrons spontaneously don't decay unless we're doing something to it. And that's because of the strong force that's going on inside. And so what happens on the inside there, the strong force is holding those quarks together, but that strong force extends a very tiny amount beyond the boundary of the proton. Because remember, the proton is not a ball with a plus sign on it like it's drawn in a, in a simple textbook, right? It's a force that is existing all around these quarks. And the strong force sort of, you can think of it as sort of leaking out a little bit outside of every neutron, a little bit, and outside of every proton. So it extends a little bit beyond every proton and neutron, grabbing onto the adjacent particles and starting to hold it together. But it doesn't leak very far out because the quarks never get very far apart from each other. And that's one of the reasons why the strong force only works over such small distances. It leaks out a tiny bit and it's really strong, but beyond a few protons away, there's almost no strong force there at all. So it's strong, but it's really, really short range force. So how does this actually work? You can imagine quarks inside of protons or neutrons as tiny particles held together by sort of stretchy gluon strings, right? This is just an analogy, right? When you try to separate them, the gluon strings pull harder, snapping them back, trying to hold them together and keeping the quarks confined. And this is known as what's called color confinement, and it ensures that quarks are never found in isolation. You're not going to smash protons together and have a single quark come out. We just don't see that, and it's because of the way the strong force behaves. Now, getting down to those gluons that mediate that strong force, they themselves carry a property known as color charge, which isn't related to the actual color of anything, but it's just sort of a descriptive term that we use to describe the strong force interactions. Quarks come with color charges too. They come with red, green, blue color charge and gluons act as the messengers constantly exchanging uh, these between the quarks to keep everything in balance. I mentioned before that at the subatomic realm in quantum mechanics, the current models, 
say that forces of nature are mediated by particles, believe it or not. So for the strong force, it's mediated by something called a gluon, which is a particle that carries that force between two objects, right? Um, so you might say, well, what governs the uh, electromagnetic force, right? Uh, electric attraction and repulsion. What, what particle governs that? Well, in the standard model, that's called the photon. You've probably heard of a photon of light, the photons that we see. Well, photons are constantly being exchanged between the positive protons of the nucleus, and that's what we call the electromagnetic force, attraction and repulsion. It's mediated by photons. And then you might say, well, what about gravity? Gravity is a force. Well, we haven't discovered them yet, but the theoretical framework says that gravity is mediated at the quantum level by something called a graviton. A graviton hasn't been discovered yet. You know, you might say, well, Einstein said gravity is a curvature of space-time. Well, this is true, and that is a good model that is uh, very accurate for us to calculate things. But relativity theory, as awesome as it is, is not a quantum theory. It, in other words, it doesn't go into discrete chunks as you get smaller in space-time. So one of the main things in physics is people are trying to unify the ideas of general relativity with curving space-time with the quantum nature of the universe, which we know is true for everything else. Everything comes in chunks, photons, particles, you know, all these things, they come in tiny little chunks. So one idea to try to unify like this is maybe space-time really does curve the way that Einstein predicted, but maybe when you zoom in on it close enough, maybe space-time is not a smooth, continuous thing. Maybe it comes in chunks too. Maybe if you could zoom in close enough, it would look like the picture on a screen or a television screen or an iPhone screen. Maybe like there's little tiny pixels, for lack of a better word, which would be the tiny little building blocks of space-time. And so maybe space-time's quantized too. And so it's just an idea. That's what they're trying to unify mathematically. So getting back to the gluons, this constant exchange of gluons inside of the proton between the quarks creates a dynamic, ever-changing field that binds the quarks together with this incredibly strong force. We call it the strong force, of course. Much, much stronger than the electromagnetic force, which is trying to push the nucleus apart from the uh, positively charges, the positive charges that are trying to push repulsively uh, apart there. So let's summarize this almost like an alien language, right? And see if we can get it out. What's happening though, here is that even though the electromagnetic force wants to send the protons flying and the nucleus exploding in every atom, the strong force, which arises from the gluon-mediated quark interactions inside the protons and neutrons, keeps everything tightly packed together inside the nucleus. It's like having a team of sort of like bungee jumping superheroes or something, pulling everyone back together when they try to stay or stray too far apart. And so this intricate dance of quarks and gluons with the strong force is what allows the protons and neutrons to form the stable nuclei. And without it, the atoms wouldn't exist at all. The universe as we know it will be a totally different place, much, much lonelier with no atoms at all. So there you have it. The strong force in all its glory arising from the interactions of quarks and gluons keeping the atomic nucleus from flying apart. It's a powerful reminder of the incredible forces at work in the tiny unseen corners of our universe. And so in summation, this is why atomic nuclei don't just blow apart and explode because of all of the interactions going on with the strong force inside. And you have to have a certain number of neutrons to help mediate and keep it all together as well because again, neutrons contain quarks and the strong force leaks out a little bit holding it together, but you can't have too few neutrons and you can't have too many neutrons, otherwise the nucleus is unstable. So the next time you think about the seemingly precarious balance within a nucleus, remember our unsung hero, the strong force. It's the powerful glue, quite literally, that keeps the heart of the atom together, allowing everything that you see around you to exist. So I'd really like to thank you for hanging out with me today, for staying all the way to the end. Until next time, stay curious, keep questioning the wonders of the universe, and drop me a line, let me know what you think about this, and remember always, stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.